So it was uh, three years ago, um, and I was operating on a 75-year-old gentleman who had uh, multiple medical problems um, in the operating room, and um, I was um, extremely preoccupied with um, the significance of his medical issues and also the difficulty of the surgery. He had acute and chronic inflammation and um, infection of the gallbladder. And while I was uh, preoccupied with uh, the whole um, situation, uh, one of the arteries called cystic artery going to the gallbladder um, ruptured and it was bleeding profusely. I tried to use the clip applier. It's a little device that we use to uh, clip the artery and it got jammed into the, in, the, um, in the device. So I asked the nurse to bring a new clip app lawyer. There was nothing in the room. She went out to get the new one. And at that time, I felt significant fear. Fear of losing my patients, you know, bleeding too much. And because of that preoccupation of my mind, because of these medical issues, I felt extremely fearful. It took probably 30 seconds for her to come back to the operating room, but for me, it felt like days. I was putting pressure on the artery and waiting. There was a puddle of blood next to the gallbladder, and I tried to suction to be able to see the artery, and then the suction device was not connected. So I asked the circulating nurse again to connect the suction device and it was not functioning. So I asked her to bring the new suction device and she went out to get the new one. And at that time I felt extreme anger, more fear, disappointment. I was still putting pressure on the artery but at the same time there was so much going on in my mind it was, it was like inside of my, my mind there was someone telling me to get more angry, more upset, and more disappointed. My heart was racing. I could feel my heart was pumping harder and harder. And it probably took her 60 seconds to bring a new suction, but for me it felt like eternity. but it didn't matter. I had to save that patient. So regardless of how desperate I felt, I shouted my name. Come on, Saeed. That's what I usually do in this very, very crazy situation, to just redirect my attention back into the bleeding. And now the clip applier was working. The suction device was appropriate and the bleeding was stopped. And the patient did very well. He actually went home the following day and didn't require any blood transfusion. But what I felt in the operating room was a significant array of incredible negative emotions. And during that moment, before I redirect my attention, I felt significant tightness in my chest. I could feel my even coronary artery is going to a spasm. And I'm sure that every one of you that work in this profession have similar event happen to you every day. Similar a stressful event that you feel extremely overwhelmed. And you can even feel the pressure inside of you. And and I'm sure if I ask every one of you, and you can hear that every day when you talk to different people, there are a lot of complaints of pressure. You know, I know some of you guys say, oh my God, there's so much work to do, so many tasks, or there's so many paperwork to fill out. You know, I feel like I'm behind a computer all day. I don't even have time to take care of my patient. 
or you say, I hate that doctor that comes in and screams at us every time he comes to the floor. Or you say, oh my God, I have very difficult patients. Or I couldn't understand that family member because he was so demanding. <clears throat> or you say, I have too many patients to take care of. When the numbers goes up from four to five or five to six, all of a sudden it looks like a massive amount of pressure on our heart. Because we preoccupied with what they told us, right? Also. Or you say, this new nurse doesn't know anything. I have to spend so much time to, to orient that, that, the nurse. Or you say, I can't work with my supervisor. She's so bossy, pushy, and unappreciated. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I know they don't say that about me. Or some of you say the r emotional roller coaster in this business is so much to tolerate, right? So these are some of these issues that we deal with every day in our, our profession. But stress is everywhere, right? It's just not at work. Stress is everywhere. And someone asked me, how many times do you feel a stress? And I said, I stress just two times, days and nights. And sometimes we get so much stress that we get stressed out because we are stressed. And then we even forget what started this stressful situation. What was that? And then we get even upset of not knowing. And that happened exactly in the operating room to me because it was like, in my mind, I was trying to make myself angrier and, and more upset. It was a simple suction and clip applier device. And if you think about it, I'm a good surgeon. I can take care of it. And it's not the nurse's fault that this clip applier doesn't work. But we do that to ourselves, right, every day. Medicine, medical profession, is extremely unique when it comes to the stress. So Dr. Sir William Osler, who's the father of modern medicine, said, medicine arose out of the primal sympathy of man with man, out of the desire to help those in sorrow, need, and sickness. This relationship arises out of pain and suffering of one person an offer of hope by another. And I really believe in this. So, medical profession is all about distress. We are dealing with pain, suffering, we are dealing with disease, we are dealing with desperate patients and family members every day. This is absolutely different from Disneyland, or when you go on vacation to Ritz Carlton Hotel or Four Seasons when you're trying to have fun. People who come here, they have problems. And it's always about problems. And on top of that, you have extremely, extremely complex health system with all of those expectations, rules, regulations, policies, compliances, new rules, and new rules to follow. And every day you come to work, you get new rules again to follow. And you see that every day, right? <coughs> so it created a very unpleasant situation for us. And I feel that <coughs> myself. And it has shown that really affects our body. You know, a stressful situation has shown significant association with different diseases, especially chronic problems like heart disease, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, ulcer disease, and also fatigue and insomnia. But it doesn't end 
just to the medical issues, it also is associated with burnout and significant exhaustion, anger, and extreme conflict with different organizations, right? Insurance companies, hospitals, people at work. Separation of patients and physicians, the breakdown of our relationship with our patients. And it has increased actually the medical errors too. This has been shown. And also patients' dissatisfaction, mistrust among us. And then, in my opinion, culture of indifference. At the end, all we say, when we can't tolerate the stress, we say, whatever, right? But before we talk about the coping strategies about the stress, let's define the stress. What does the stress mean? So stress is an individual perception of a physical, mental, or emotional stimulus as a challenging, threatening or overwhelming event when it exceeds our available coping resources. And what does that mean? It just means it's a perception. When it's perception of the event, when it's above and beyond our coping resources. That's what that means. So what happens to our body when we develop a stress? starts with a stimulus, right? And then that a stimulus sends in our brain. It processed and also it appraised. And then at the end, you get that a stress response. And we call that fight or flight response, right? Or sometimes fight, flight, and freeze. And if you were here last December, you remember. I had that moment, right? Because public speaking is a stressful. It's not easy. You remember, right? <laughs> but it all goes back to perception. How you feel that the stress response, it happens to all of us. But it goes back to our perception, and our perception is a very, very subject, subjective. It's different from every one of us. And it's really related to our priorities, experiences, goals, our values, our beliefs, and also physical and psychological coping resources. If a puppy comes into the room, you probably like it, you smile and you hold it, you try to touch it, but I probably will jump on the, on the table, right? Because it's the ideas that I have about the dog, the history, the experience that I have, it creates that stress response for me. For me, it's overwhelming, for you, fun. And it happens all the time, right? There's so many events that happen to me. And sometimes we look at each other and when we share these moments and these events, we can say, what is she talking about? It's not a stressful. When you talk about four patients, one to five patients all of a sudden, and you say, hmm, it's so much, I can't understand it anymore. But in reality, it's your perception. And your values and your beliefs are also very important. And, and your priorities, how, how much you care. If somebody tells me, so and so, if I hear in the news, so and so, develop a cancer. I say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. But if somebody says, your father developed a cancer today, and he has six months, to live, then you get massive amount of stress. You feel that inside of you. So you see the priorities, 
you see the values and experiences, you know how important that is, how we perceive distress. Now I'm going to talk about the neuroanatomy here, but don't get too overwhelmed. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> so you remember the brain has three major areas, right? Cortex, the limbic system, and the midbrain. The midbrain is the one that controls your vital sign. You know, your heart rate and breathing and temperatures and all that. Limbic system is this area of your brain, and that is your emotional computer, is an emotional center. And the cortex is the one that allows you to move, feel, sense the stimulus, and also is your executive function, the cognitive function, right? But they have so many connections. So the limbic system, which is located in that area, and it's um, involved different structures that controls your, your emotion, or even produce and control your emotion. It com contains the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and then the cingulate cortex right here. That's the one that create emotions. And what happens in our brain when we feel the stimulus? When the stimulus comes to our, our, our body, how, what happens in our brain? That's very important because that helps you to understand how you cope with the, with the stress in the right way. So when the stress comes in, whether it comes in as a touch, smell, or you as visual, or it's a auditory, it goes and path the pathway towards the amygdala. Some of them directly, like a smell and tactile, and some of them goes to the thalamus right here when, when it's visual or auditory. And then thalamus is like a rotor of your computer. It's redirect these, these inputs, okay, to an appropriate place. And then the information goes into this little uh, nucleus called amygdala. Amygdala is your computer of fear, stress response, okay? So when the information, for example, you see a threat, you look at me like I'm crazy, and then I feel the threat because of your look, right? It goes into the thalamus, and it goes into the amygdala quickly through a very, very short pathway. And then amygdala sends that, and it sends it down into the midbrain and activate our stress response. Okay, that's a, that's called low road or a short road. It's very primitive, and that's very quick. That's that's the one that is innate in every one of us. It's actually an adaptive response. We're supposed to have that. It's for our survival. That's the time when the car comes in towards you. You all of a sudden jump away from it. You don't have time to think about it. It's not cortical at all. It's subcortical. It's right here. And there's a lot of reactions and instances that happens during the day. It happens just like here, right in that area. Like the fact that when I was bleeding and the clip applier didn't work, I didn't think about the clip applier, it's just the device and it might malfunction in that moment. I just got fearful and reacted with, with my heart rate, right? I didn't think about it at that moment. Now, thalamus also sends some of the information back into the area that is a visual area of the cortex and also the auditory area of the cortex and it's, meta me um, it's process it, reprocess it, reappraise it, feel the significance of that stimulus and then sends back again those information to your prefrontal region which is the front part of your brain goes back to the amygdala and that process is called high road. That's the one that it's more intellectual. When we react to the stimulus, 
when we calm, we make decisions appropriately, that's coming from that road. So this road sometimes even activate the amygdala, but most of the time it's cool it down. I always tell my wife, I say, my amygdala is probably this size. <laughs> And it's funny because everything that happens around us, because of our sensitivity, it makes that amygdala fire throughout the day, okay? Fire throughout the day. So that's why when you wake up sometimes in the morning, you say, I don't understand why I'm so anxious. I don't even know, nothing happened to me. I just woke up, but I'm very anxious. Have you heard, have you had that situation? I have that a lot. <laughs> You know what that anxiety is? It's coming from this nucleus right here. It's a constant firing between these two. And because it's subcortical, we don't understand it. We don't know what is happening here. Here, not here. Right, but, but that's, that's anxiety. That's anxiety. If I wanna make you more overwhelmed, look at this picture. So those are the data from the emotional stimulus that goes to the thalamus and then goes to the amygdala and then from the amygdala goes directly to the lower part of our brain and activate our stress in, uh, um, response. But also, also from the thalamus goes back into the cortex and then from the cortex it's reprocessed in the rest of the area of our limbic system and that part, the hippocampus, is the important area of our memory. It mixes it with our experiences that I, we had in the past, reappraise the uh, stimulus. So if I know that you're a very bad person and you look at me with a very bad look, that look is enough to make me upset, to make me fearful, because I have this memory of you that you were a bad person, you were not good to me. With this look, I know something's wrong. Something's going on. Yeah? That's exactly what hippocampus does. It mixes it up with the memory and then goes back into the amygdala and sends those uh, output. Okay? Now, what we wanted to understand is that Every process, every stimulus gets a little tag of the emotion also. When the stimulus comes to us, when we wanted to put it in our memory, we put a little tag of the emotion to it. And the emotion produced somehow inside the limbic system. And it's not just the fear, it's not just the anger and disappointment. It's also positive emotions coming from the limbic system, love. Without the limbic system, we're nobody, right? We don't have love, we don't feel pain, we don't have fear. So those are all innate and adaptive mechanisms of our body for, for um, survival, to survive, to be able to create connection with each other with our spouses, with our um, kids, with our friends, to be able to live in a social situation, to be able to survive. This all goes back to survival. This all goes back to survival. Those are all, all innate mechanisms for our body. It's, we're born with them. But another thing that happened to us is that sometimes amygdala hijack our brain when the stressful emotion, the stressful stimulus is so high, is so high, does not allow the prefrontal or cortical area to inhibit our emotion. It goes back, the firing up towards the, towards the prefrontal region, the cortical region, completely shut down our ability to regulate and modulate our emotion. And that's why we get crazy all of a sudden. We act crazy, right? The clip applier is not there, I'm gonna throw out the clip applier to the wall, right? 
That's what happens. Sometimes it's not our fault. These, these inputs hijacks our prefrontal region. And when it goes down, everybody knows that it activates that axis, you know, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. It generates adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisone, cortisol inside our, our body. And then you develop those reactions, right? You know, we sweat, heart rate goes up, we breathe so fast. This is adaptive because what body tries to do is make us ready to fight or flight, right? It's trying to put all, redistribute the blood circulation to our brain and also to our legs, to our muscles, and get rid of the blood circulation to the, to the stomach because who cares when you're dealing with a, a mean person to digest the hamburger that you had <laughs> in that moment, right? You don't care. So our body tells us, forget about the stomach, forget about um, the intestine, let's send the blood to our brain and our muscles. And also, other thing it does, it, the other thing it does, it's, um, it shut down the parasympathetic area. The parasympathetic area is the other part of the nervous system that is responsible to calm down our heart and our brain and every other structures, right? But this is me in December. I was trying to get a little stressed out. I was stressed out, right? But the, when you get a stress out, when you do something important, it's actually helpful for you. When I remember when I was doing my exams, when I came from my country, I had to do very difficult exams. I didn't even study here. <laughs> Those exams were so long and so hard. English was not even my first language. So you can understand and imagine how difficult that was to sit for four to eight hours. And I did in three months, I did nine exams of Canadian and American. But every day, I had a ritual to go. I was scared, shaky, my hands were cold, but I accepted that challenge because that stress was helpful for me to focus, to improve my memory, to put me on my toes. Because, and I was, it was funny because I was sit, sitting in that exam room, huge exam room, and I could see people sitting there during that very difficult exam and having a sandwich and eating that sandwich. And I was surprised. I said, you're trying to activate your parasympathetic structures. Your brain doesn't have any circulation. You're not going to be able to remember anything. OK? So a stress, when it's appropriate, it's actually help us. So not every stress is bad at all. In fact, it helps for our motivation. It makes us focus when it's optimum. If you don't have a stress, you're going to be a beach bomb, <laughs> laying down in the beach every day <laughs> and getting sunburned. And you know what happens to you? You get melanoma. <laughs> right? And also, when you use drugs, this is what happened to you too. You don't feel a stress. You know why people go towards the drugs, alcohol? Because they want to be this. They're so afraid of this. They're so afraid to be stressful. That's why the, stress, the, the, the high stress disorders, like a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorders are very, very highly associated with abuse, addictive behaviors. Because they wanted to do this. They're so afraid of that feeling. But what I say to you today about coping mechanisms is completely against drugs. I don't even take Advil when I have pain. No drugs, okay? 
and I don't like this life is about caring life is about feeling the pain and love and if you're unable to feel pain you're going to be unable to feel love right and I don't like that at all but when it's too much you get to this part you get fatigued exhausted and then you get disease okay and the effect of a stress is so much in everywhere in our body from our brain to changes our mood makes us more upset and angry every day or or irritable irritable you remember when I say we get preoccupied or irritable when you come in and you and somebody says today we don't have breakfast because the kitchen was not working all of a sudden we feel so much pain and anger right to get upset it affects our stomach risk of heart you know stomach pain upset so many people get belly discomfort you know heart problem your blood pressure goes up I remember a few years ago I went to Rite Aid and I don't I'm, I'm healthy I do exercise every day and then I went to the Rite Aid and there was a free area for checking my blood pressure and I put my hand and my <laughs> blood pressure was 148 over 85 I said what is going on <laughs> I play tennis I exercise every day and why is it my blood pressure is so high? Those are the moments that changed my life. I understood. I wanted to understand what's going on. And that's why I went to study all of these things. To understand what is happening inside of me. How can I fix these problems? So I started meditation. I started yoga. I tried to work on my brain to calm myself down and it helped after six months my blood pressure was back to normal and I don't take medications a stress also has other effects that you might even not notice is related to a stress you know it's loss of appetite I'm not going to talk about this part <laughs> restlessness <laughs> you get worried all the time your judgment affected uh, by that and then also loss of confidence irritability you know um, apprehension and all the bad stuff and now this is very very important these are all done these are all what I tell you right now is the collection of 20 years of studies of people incredible researchers especially in the United States that's why I'm very proud to be here because it's so incredible how many people working on these things and it's just so amazing that how they um, um, they contributed to our understanding about different things that happens in daily life, right? And it really helps us if you really study about it, okay? And what has shown that increased stress when it's continuous or repetitious and it's intense, those are the bad stress we're talking about, that actually affecting the structure of your brain it decreases the size of your prefrontal area and also decreases the size of your cells, kills the, the, the cells in your hippocampus, which is your memory. So it's been shown that the chronic stress can affect your sleep, poor nutrition, emotional distress, but it decreases your attention, perception, short term memory, learning, and finding words after a while. So coping the strategies, now we get to the fun part, right? Now, this is what a lot of people come up with the coping the strategies for many, 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 many years, right? I mean, that's, the stress is, is we, we're born with the stress. So this is the normal um, coping strategy that a lot of us have, right? We come in on Monday and we say, don't speak to me. And then Tuesday you say, God, get me through this day and on Wednesday we say please kill me 
Okay? And on Thursday, you feel a little bit better. Friday, you start jumping around because you're anticipating the, the weekend. And then Saturday, Sunday is good. But unfortunately, this coping mechanism does not apply to me because I work on weekends too and I'm on call most of the time. So that doesn't apply to me. The other coping mechanism is this. You say whatever. Just do it. Just throw it to me. Throw it to me. I don't care. You have more policies and procedures? <laughs> throw it to me. I have to fill out more paperwork? Throw it to me. I have to see more patients? Throw it to me. I don't give a damn. I don't care. That's all. That's a coping mechanism, right? The other coping mechanisms that some people do is a short-term strategy to relieve the stress. Thank God we don't see that that often here, right? And one of the most common strategies is, uh, you know, just, I don't give a damn, I'm not going to do it. And I know why you're laughing, because it's very common, right? It's common, even in our profession. And the last one that is very, very important that some of us do this is that's the strategy. You have to just make sure when you get unconscious, you have to stop it. <laughs> but let's be really serious. I wanted to tell you about a very important part of our brain. And I told that in one of our sessions before. The prefrontal region is the front part of the frontal lobe. And it's right here behind our forehead. And that's the one that separates us with other primate gorillas and you know, other things. It makes us human. It makes us different. It makes us make decisions, come up with the strategies, in, uh, innovate, be creative control our behaviors and emotions. And the reason I want to show you this picture is that you see what that area is? It's called limbic system. And what is that? It's your emotional center, your computer of emotion. And you see how they are connected together? And that's why it's so incredible the way that the, our brain evolution happened, it brought this area closer to our limbic system and even our midbrain area that controls our vital signs, our heart rate. There's so many incredible connections in those regions to modulate and regulate our emotion. <coughs> There's so many connections between amygdala and hippocampus and front part of our brain. You need to understand that, otherwise you would not understand what I'm talking about, about the coping mechanisms. You remember this picture? We talked about the executive function. That's the prefrontal function. Okay? It's the one that gives you the personality, the character. It, it's the one that separates you from the primate, it's the one that gives you the social intelligence. It does all of these. But the most important ones that is re rel um, related to the stress response, these are the ones. Con control impulses. Anticipation. Flexibility and shifting strategies. It initiate the appropriate behavior and stop and inhibit inappropriate behavior. It gives us perception and it helps to regulate our emotion, right? Those are the important functions. And why did I turn that gray? Just to remember, attention is part that controls by prefrontal area, okay? We'll go back to that. But I remember one of my, a father of one of my friends, he was a 
um, general of um, army, extremely serious, well behaved, you know, well mannered, you know, incredible character. And at the end of his life, he um, developed prefrontal tumor, and then he was able to walk and do the regular activity, but he lost his personality. And I remember at the end of his life when we were going with my friend to his house, he, um, he was with his shorts and pajamas and sometimes soaked. And when he was sitting and eating, he was putting the um, uh, food into the mouth and rubbing it on his face and stuff. Very, very behavior reaction. So the prefrontal is the one to make us who we are, okay? Now, the coping strategies that I'm going to tell you right now <coughs> is work of, inspired the work of so many researchers throughout the last 20 years. So many people, Dan Siegel, um, Suzanne Falk, uh, Falkman, um, and uh, uh, Richard Davidson, um, Barbara Fredrickson. I studied a lot of these works, and a lot of people work on these type of strategies to decrease, um, not decrease, to be able to manage and cope with the stress. But I gathered the ones that are important for our profession, and I thought based on my experience, based on what I think and how I feel <coughs> may be helpful for us to change our perception towards what's going on in our um, daily work, okay? Now, before we start telling you that 10 strategies, because remember, I remember she was telling me, okay, so what are we doing with this project? What's going on with this project, right? What is the one, two, three steps that we're gonna do? I finally gave up and I said, okay, I'm gonna come up with the 10 strategies, right? So we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about the 10 strategies of coping, but before you have to understand this is based on this research that neurons, and neuroplasticity. Neuro you know, this is a beautiful picture of the neuron. And we have 100 billion neurons in our brain, and every neuron has 10,000 connections with each other. It's incredible. I, if I go back again, and and born again, and I, go, I would go and study neuroscience, because it's so incredible, okay? And um, when I was a medical student, I remember they would tell us, brain does not change. you born, the cells never, when they die, you don't grow back the cells, you can't make any changes, and it's all a closed chapter. But now we know you can make changes, you can even practice to improve your brain. Okay, you can practice, and you can change your character. You can change yourself, even at your age, even at 90 years old. The first strategy is reframe your mindset. Okay, that's the strategy that I really believe in our profession will help. And what that means is we know that purpose, purpose in life is so incredibly important to tolerate and cope with the struggles and challenges of daily life. If you don't have purpose and meaning when you come to work, everything is painful. And medical profession gives you that, that purpose because medicine is about healing, is about serving others, it's about taking care of other people. That's the purpose of it. And when you chose to be in this profession, you promised that you're gonna do that. Why not take an advantage of that idea and reframe your brain? Reframe your brain, your mindset. So this job is not about me coming to work every day and clock in and eight hours later clock out. It's about me coming to work feeling incredible because I'm doing something magical and that's serving others, helping people. And that will change your perspective towards the stressful events because the challenges, daily challenges, 
that difficult patient is not a difficult patient anymore. It's a patient that is in pain, a patient that is suffering. That family member is not a difficult family member anymore because that family member is a desperate family member that has significant socioeconomic and physical pain. Those challenges does not feel, they're, they're there. The challenge is there. You still have to deal with them when they're trashing around, when they're yelling at you. But the way you feel it and perceive it is very different. You gotta practice that. So reframing your mindset is, is incredibly important as a coping mechanism. I, I remember about the reframing um, the mindset. I remember when I started my practice, I was taking calls every night. And at work, I was working every day. And then when I would go home and see my family, before I go to bed, somebody called me from the ER. We have a patient with a perforated bowel, and I need you to come in. And we, I, I had to come in, and I was fighting with myself because I was tired and I was exhausted. And I had to work the whole night, and then in the morning, I had to go again throughout my day, right? There was no rest. But I, one day, I told myself, I sat down, I told myself, you know what? This is what I chose. I love this job. I wanted to do it. I'm saving somebody's life. That person that has perforation, if I don't do the surgery by morning, might die. That changed everything to me. I didn't feel the tiredness of pain of not sleeping. That will help. You have to try it and practice it. The second one is command your inner conversation. So every one of us has an inner conversation, inner dialogue. We wake up every morning, we talk to each other, and there's something going on in our, inside our brain. Right now, I know you're thinking about, you know, what are they, um, what are they uh, uh, doing in the kitchen? what kind of food we're going to have in lunch, right? You're going to think about, okay, the, you know, what is she thinking? What kind, of, what kind of boots she's wearing, right? These things are coming to our mind right now, right? No, I mean, you're sitting here, you're looking at me, and I'm talking to you, and I promise you, you had these inner conversation with yourself. Do you have that? Did you have that? Okay, so I know, I know you, have, you had that, right? I talked myself into getting out of bed this morning. Yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of inner conversation going on, and some of these inner conversations are not important. Sometimes they actually important, makes us more worried and upset, okay? Because we add it together it, in, inside our brain. We activate our amygdala ourselves by thinking, by worrying. You know what worry comes from? Cor worries are actually thoughts coming from our corti cortex. We created that because we have the ability to anticipate we create those thoughts in our brain. And again, some of them are not good, some of them are good, some of them are important. You know, like when you um, involving with an with a, um, interaction with somebody and you don't like it and you want to punch that person and you tell yourself, don't do it, don't do it. You had that, right, that inner conversation? So now, instead of letting inner conversation to take over, we take over the inner conversation. And that's what I do. That's what I have done in my life. Try to talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Don't talk too loud because they say you're crazy. But talk to yourself. Okay? You tell yourself, you tell yourself the values every day. That's your ritual. Before you come to work, this is what I do. When I park in the parking lot, before I come out of the car, I would say a couple of things. I know why I'm here. I know what I do. I know I do a good job, and I'm going to do a great job. And it's magical. Every time I want to go to a room to see a patient, before I enter the room, I tell myself inside of my brain, be nice. It doesn't matter how you feel, how tired you are, be nice. Be compassionate, be kind when you get in there. Don't get agitated, don't let them see inside of you, just, just, just do it. And it changed your life. Every time you go to talk to a family member, talk to yourself. Remind yourself of your values and the positivities. 
don't when you go in and you have that mindset of that person is a bad person or it's a bad family member or difficult patient you're gonna react to that situation for sure no question but if you tell yourself one second before you enter the room to say I know why they do what they do because they're in pain I'm gonna react in a different way and that change your way and your perception and that's not going to be overwhelming anymore okay we're not talking about minimizing the, the stress because the stress is there we're not, I'm not talking about minimizing the stress those are strategies were the ones that you hit your head to the wall right that's I'm not talking about that the stress is there we're talking about how you perceive that as less harmful pause pause is the other strategy that is incredibly important. Just like when I was in the opera room, if I pause for one second before I get angry and shout and throw out the clip applier to the wall for a few seconds, uh, you know what I would do? My brain allow me to use that high road instead of using that reactive short road, use the high road. All those stimulus that was going to me, that the stressful events, reappraise in my prefrontal region. All of a sudden, you see the things differently. And we do that all the time. Sometimes, we can't stop it. When I say all of these things, I practice it myself. It doesn't mean that I do it all the time, because sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's hard, but you really have to practice it. So pause. And Viktor Frankl is the, is the guy is a, um, a, a incredible guy with an incredible story. And he says, between a stimulus and response, there's a space. And that a space is our power to choose our response, and it was, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Okay? And that's called pause. So daily practice of pause has strength, has strengthened your prefrontal region. And I promise you, why did I talk about the stress prefrontal area? Because all of these things goes back into your improving your prefrontal area. If you care about you being a good human being, then these practices will help. If you don't care and you want to be different, like a different primate, then that's okay. But if you really care, these are work. They, and it's not coming from me. These are all the studies, by the way. As I told you, I got inspired with the work of other people. Now, accept and let go. Accept and let go means there are things that we cannot change. I'm not going to fight with Jacob. When Jacob comes in and says, you have to fill out all these paperwork, there's nothing I can do. I got to do it. I accept. That doesn't mean that you let people to hit your head all, every day. You still have to have your dignity and your power. But there are things that even though might be so stupid, but you just have to accept it. And you know why? Because you have limited energy in your brain. If you waste your energy for things that you cannot change, and, and even when you can change, you grab on it and you hold on it all day, and you get upset because you couldn't change it, you lose that power and energy. So you gotta let go and then focus on things that you can't do. If the family member is yelling at you and you cannot stop it, there's a, so much stuff you can do, right? Some people, they're out of it because they're taking medications or whatever. They have a behavior problem. And I work with some people that you cannot change their personality. They're, they're them. So if I want to fight with them every day, I just lose my energy. So all I do is just say, let go and work on people or things that they can change. And that's what I'm trying to do. Because I can't change the system. I cannot change the system. But I can change you, inspire you to be a good human being. So when I come and work with you, sitting in the recovery and doing my thing and conversing, I feel good about myself, about life. I feel less 
this harm, harm and less stress. And we can do that on the floor. You practice. You practice. You can do it. If you change that culture in your floor, I promise you, you're going to feel less stress when you know everybody do the same thing and you have friends that they're helping you and they understand you. Regardless of what the system tells you, we follow, we do it. Discover and accentuate positive sides of events. Every, this quote I came, can, um, I did it myself. So hopefully you like it. In the heart of every sad story lies a positive one. And I tell that to my patients when that 35-year-old female with the breast cancer came to my office and the first day I said to her, you know, unfortunately, your biopsy was positive and you have breast cancer. And for one second, she completely froze and started crying. And I know, I knew that she's not going to listen to me anymore. She would not listen anything about surgery and procedures and stuff. So all I had to say to her is just, you know, I know it's hard and it's painful, but it has happened to you. Now you gotta accept it. But there are a lot of things positive. You're in a place that we can take care of you. You're young. Your tumor has not metastasized, and we can take it out, and you're going to be okay. There's a positive in every sad story. And you know, it was amazing, magical, when all of a sudden her face turned happy. It was a happiness in a moment of sadness, but that's the beauty of our brain. That's the beauty of our brain, that we can feel these emotions. And it's our responsibility as a professional um, healthcare to, to understand these positives and accentuate them, okay? And sharing and storytelling, it's been years, thousands and thousands of years that human beings do this to um, teach, other human beings about the, their experiences and then relieve their pain and suffering by sharing these moments. And that was the reason that we started this project from the first day. That's why we have these meetings every month. And I promise you that it helps just sharing these difficult times, these moments of pain and a stressful events together, it calms us down. Sometimes I go home and I listen to my wife. She's a, she's a dentist, she works hard, she has issues again, her with her office and everything. She comes in, I try to just listen. I used to try to react and respond to her and say, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Not anymore, you don't want to do that. I just want to listen to her. And when you listen to them, it makes them feel comfortable, it decreases their pain, and you don't feel that as more overwhelming and stressful sharing and storytelling. And that's why I'm trying to encourage you to talk to your, uh, be among yourselves, hear, share stories, and acknowledge the kind and compassionate acts that happens every day. You don't see that. Every time you turn on the TV, you 90% of the things that we listen is somebody killed somebody, somebody raped somebody, somebody has into the war, beheaded other people. We don't hear the act of kindness and compassion that every one of us do. You hear one person got leg got chopped off. It was the right leg was supposed to be the left leg, right? You hear that all the time in the news. Have you heard somebody says, in this hospital we saved 100 people last year from, from their disease. You don't hear that. We need to do that. We need to acknowledge our kind and compassionate acts and celebrate our humanity and gratitude. It doesn't matter who you are, what ethnicity, what culture, what language. 
what color. It doesn't matter what religion you believe. Life is a gift of being alive and being able that have that opportunity to to be able to talk and converse and create connections and and love. That's just deserve gratitude. And when you do gratitude, whether to God or, or whatever you believe, it decrees the way it, it changes the way and you pay, perceive the stimu stimulus and the stressful events. It calms you down. You gotta believe me. And and practice the essence of humanity. That's magic. When you come in every day and you tell yourself, I'm going to be a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more kind. I'm going to treat, create connection. I'm going to ask someone that I never asked how they join, what's going on in their lives. And it just revolutionized your mind, your personality. I couldn't understand what transcends means. But that's what that means. It elevates you as a human being. It makes you different. <clears throat> and practice mindful meditation. I started mindful meditation for last more than six months. I used to do it, but not religiously, but now I do it. It really helps. What med mindful meditation does, it actually strengthens your prefrontal region. And I'm going to have one session about the mindful meditation once in this year. We're going to practice that, and you understand when you do it how calm you get about the different stressful situation. It changes you, and it just improves, and it's been shown that practicing mindful meditation calms you down. It helps your prefrontal region to be able to dominate the amygdala, dominate your responses, the stressful responses. And the personal health and wellness, that's the last strategy, okay? That's the last strategy. And what does it involve? Daily exercises, right? Yoga, that's me. And nutrition, you know? Really um, being religious about, you know, what we choose to eat. And that's not me. <laughs> it look like me, but it doesn't. Um, daily fun activities, you know, hiking, biking, playing tennis, okay? And then exercising, breathing. Breathe is incredibly important. I didn't understand it until I study it and I really believe in it right now because when you breathe, you activate the parasympathetic structures in your brain and it calms your heart down and make you calm. Parasympathetic area is a re just the, the same way we have an innate um, fight or flight response, which is adrenaline and cortisol and all this stuff. We also have a, a relaxation system in our body, and that's the parasympathetic structures, the autonomic system. And breathing is one of the, one of the things, practices that you activate that, you decrease your heart rate. And now, when I get upset, when the suction doesn't work, I take a couple of deep breaths. Sometimes I close my eyes for one second, and then all of a sudden, you see that scenario, that situation, very different. It's magical. It's magical. Lifetime learning. Over the last three years, I've learned so much about life just by studying. It's just incredible. When you study, it just changes you. Because I was so involved with medicine and studying medicine, I lost a lot of my years. But now, I'm like a hung hungry person studying, reading, researching, and that really helps me. So lifetime reading and studying is important. And sleep. I was against the sleep all the time. I didn't want to sleep. 
because I didn't want to lose any time of my life for that wrong, especially now that I'm old. I see the wrinkles and I'm not as fit as before. Really, I need some rest. And resting and sleeping is very important. And friendship. Friendship is incredibly important. And at the end, family. Relationships. That's just, if you create that relationship, then you really help your health and your wellness. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.